good evening, everybody. I hope you're all well. Uh, lovely to have you all here. Uh, my name, as you can see on the screen, is Tom Bromley. So I'm Head of Learning here at Reedsy. Uh, and as Martin was saying uh, a moment ago, so I lead uh, Reedsy's uh, premium uh, How to Write a Novel course, which is a three-month course uh, where we teach you and guide you through uh, the, uh, the entirety of a draft, actually, from, from the beginning. Uh, through uh, to the end. Um, and on this live session, what I want to do is just give you a little flavour of some of the things we do uh, on, on the writing course. So as part of that, we have a weekly uh, live class, um, and these come in, in three versions. So sometimes we do uh, what we call a live editing class. Some of you may have been uh, here a couple of weeks ago where I did a sort of sample version of those. Sometimes I do a deep dive into a particular writing topic. Uh, and then every few weeks we have a guest author along. I think it's really useful uh, for new writers to hear from uh, kind of writers who are at the top of their game, who are there uh, kind of writing, getting published and understand and learn from their experiences. Um, and so that's what we're going to do uh, this evening. I'm delighted that we've got uh, Andy Maslin uh, with us this evening. So Andy is one of the authors actually who features on the, on the course videos as well. Uh, but he's also the author of a fantastic new book, uh, The Seventh Girl, uh, which was published uh, just at the beginning of this month, actually. Um, and we're going to talk about this uh, in particular in detail and then go on to talk a little bit more widely uh, about Andy's writing career uh, and, uh, yes, and, and some kind of stuff about kind of marketing uh, and self-publishing uh, as well. Uh, but, Andy, very good to, to have, have you with us and very nice to see you. How are you? Yeah, I'm good, Tom. Lovely to be here. Thanks for having me. Um, it, it, it's great to have you here. Um, I, was, I was trying to count up. I sort of lost count in terms of how many books you've you've written i thought fiction wise is it 30 32 33 um 33 there are okay. three unpublished um two of them are pretty much done dusted and in the publisher's machine and then the latest one i'm sitting on because it, i've got until the 24th of april but i'm ahead of the game so i've got a little bit of time to sort of tweak it if i want to and, so, yeah, and, and, and fiction. Of the, yeah Literary fiction, which is which is amazing, um, and 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 out of those and out of those books, I think you've written uh, sort of four series uh, in, in particular. So there's one character called called Gabriel Wolf. We might talk about uh, Stella Cole, uh, uh, Detective Ford, uh, and yeah. then uh, Kit Kit Ballant sort of Cat Ballantine, who is the author, the sort of protagonist of your new book. Uh, That's right. Yeah. Yeah. So do you want to tell us just a little bit about uh, what The Seventh Girl is, is about? And I think you're going to kick off by giving us, give us a short reading to give us a flavour of what the, what the book is like. Yeah, sure. Do you want me to just sort of summarise it and then do the reading? Yeah, that'd be fantastic. Uh, OK, so it's, I think genre-wise, we would call this uh, general crime rather than police procedural. You know, together with my publisher, Leodora Darlington, who's now moved on to Orion, we very much wanted to have the widest possible audience and decided to focus very much on Kat as a a local girl. You know, she knows the town of Middlehampton. She's part of it. Um, and the the premise really is um, so there's a great blurb they've written. It, they 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 thought he was gone. They were wrong. And the idea is there was a serial killer active in Middlehampton 15 years ago. His seventh victim was Kat's best friend. Um, and then 15 years go by, she's joined the police, driven to solve murders because of her trauma with uh, Liv, the, the dead girl. And, um, you know, he, he suddenly starts up again, or it, it appears, you know, she's convinced it's the same guy. And her tool of a boss, you know, is having none of it. He's just saying it's copycat, you know, just stop grandstanding. And the story sort of picks up from there. And her, I think what really works with this series and what, what I love about Kat is that she's doing that classic female thing, you know, or people think something that people recognize of juggling her family life, her kid, her work, her spare time, you know, her hobbies, her groups of friends, all the while dealing with this trauma of her lost friend. Her father is a corrupt property developer. So she has to keep an air gap between her and him for obvious reasons. Um, and it's all sort of interwoven with her life in, in Middlehampton. And do you want to just give us a, a, a short reading from the start so we can get a, a flavour yeah. of what the book is like? And, that, and then I'd, I'd love to talk to you a little bit about the, the, the writing of this, of this very beginning. Sure. OK, then. So it's summer 2008. 
19 year old Sally Robb feels her stomach squirming, but it's a kind of giddy excitement. He's older than her and out of uniform, she can see he's actually pretty buff. He must work out. She smiles at the memory of her date's shy invitation. I thought we could go for a walk in Brearley Woods, he said. Isn't that where he's dumping them, she asked. He grinned, you're not scared, are you? She wasn't then, isn't now. As they enter the woods, she looks around. They have the place to themselves. It's magical, every shade of green you could imagine. Sunlight coming down in bright stripes like through the blinds at home. Mum loves her Venetians, says curtains make the place look old fashioned, whatever. A loud crack somewhere to their right makes her jump. Oh my God, she says, what was that? He laughs, jumpy, aren't we? It's probably just a deer. She slips her arm through his. God, his muscles are rock hard. He turns and grins at her, looking ridiculously happy. Another crack, to their left this time. She tries to imagine a little brown deer nosing about for acorns or whatever it is that deer eat, and not a weirdo with a massive knife stalking them. Are you sure it's just a deer, she asks. It might be a rabbit, I suppose. She scratches the back of her neck, flipping her long brown hair out of the way. She looks over her shoulder, but they're alone, and she relaxes again. A third crack makes her jump, literally. Maybe we should go back, she says, holding his arm tighter. But we're nearly there, he says. Look, I'll prove it's nothing. He strides off through the ferns, leaving her alone on the path. There's a loud rustle and more cracking. Her pulse races, her nerves are alight, only now it's not excitement, it's fear. And then she laughs out of sheer relief. It really is a deer, a little brown thing with creamy spots on its back. The creature strolls onto the path in front of her on these adorable spindly legs. It stands completely still for a second, gazing at her with long lashed eyes. Hey, she coos, you're so pretty. It blinks once, turns and bounds away, white tail flashing through the ferns. But where is he? Surely he should have come straight out after the deer. She calls his name. No answer. She calls out again, louder this time, trying not to panic. Because she's shouting, she doesn't hear the footsteps behind her. Hi, Sally, he murmurs in her ear. Just before she dies, she catches the smell of lavender. Wow. Andy, thank you for reading. I, I always think it's really nice to hear uh, the, 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 the text spoken uh, by the author. You can really get a sense of the, of the feel of the rhythm and, and the flow of the sentences. Um, and I want to ask you some specific questions about the writing of this in a, in a second. But I just want to begin by asking uh, about the use of, of prologues. I, I know some writers really like them. Some writers don't. Some editors really like them. Some writers don't. Do all your books have prologues or do you, is this something that happens in, in some books where it works or do you have a set rule? How, how does it work for you with, with well, books? Well, my, my first editor, as one T. Bromley Esquire, once advised me that, you know, nobody likes a prologue. You know, if you just call it chapter one and get on with it. Uh, and I, you know, I took that to heart for a long time. And I think you can do that. You know, you, if you can just sort of number the chapters like that. But with this book specifically, it happened 15 years ago and the, the premise of the book and it's in the blurb and in some ways it's sort of hinted at in the title is there has been this massive gap during which her life has, you know, everything has changed and it just felt, you know, a 15 year earlier story, which has really worked as a prologue and it sets up really the whole plot, you know, it sets up the story. There's all sorts of clues in that prologue, which, if you, you won't know what they mean, but if you hang on to them, virtually everything reveals itself to be useful later on. But I don't always do it. You know, I, I, I do like to start, you know, as I say, in medias res, you're in the middle of things, or some people call it a cold open. Uh, but yeah, now and again, you know, in fact, the book I'm just restarting, which is a, a Gabriel Wolf, there's a, a prologue because it's a Russian scientist who's just developed a kind of doomsday weapon and it's 1983 and Andropov is the general secretary and it just seemed again to be filmically I can see this in a different you know 
film stock or a different digital treatment to make it feel then and then we go bam and it's now and it's in Honduras and it's this farmer cutting sugarcane. So I think I, I would say in the service of the story, I'll do whatever I think is going to work best. And, and, and do you find in terms of the sequence of the writing, is, is this where you start with the writing or do prologues tend to be something that you then come back to and add in at a later stage in the in the draft? Uh, do you know, I think with both of these, they they I always knew that I was going to start it with a prologue. Um, I've, over the years, I mean, not there have been that many, but over the years I have shifted a lot from being a pure kind of pantser where we just sit down and start writing to a planner. And I'm getting very into planning now um, and loving it. And that does give you the, the sort of intellectual luxury of, of knowing what you want to do right from the beginning. So with both of these books, I, I could really, I mean, this girl, you know, in the woods, Sally, I could just really picture her and I could see this woodland, you know, and it's, it's sort of recapitulated in the cover art. You know, I, I had this incredibly vivid image in my mind of her with her boyfriend in this woodland. And as I say, because I'd set up the whole thing, you know, with notes and drawings and timelines and arcs and all the rest of it, I just saw this prologue straight away. So pretty much if I'm going to use one, I'll, I'll start there. Okay. Um, I want to ask you a couple of questions just about the writing itself. I hopefully we can, we can bring the, the, the text back up. Um, but one of the, one of the questions I want to ask about was your use of tense. So the, the so the book itself, the main book is written in the, in the past tense, but in the prologue here, you've written it in the, in the present. Yeah. Um, and again, I just wondered what the what the thinking was behind that shift, because um, actually this is this is set in the past, but it's in the present tense. And then when we're in the present, we're in the yeah. past tense, if that uh, makes sense. Yes, indeed. I think, I mean, obviously, the, the prologue is what, 2008, but because we are there, and in fact, there's a helpful thing saying summer 2008, we can take it as the present for now. I do it when I want to have that incredible sense of immediacy. You know, it's in the free and direct voice. It's, it's super close into Sally. It's not it's not first person Sally, but it's super close in. You know, you're almost like right behind her. And it makes it feel like it's happening right now to you. And there's sort of almost no, there's no barrier. There's no artifice between you and the action. You know, and I do it a lot with fight scenes as well, where I'll, I'll flip from a, I mean, I pretty much always write in the past tense actually, but often with fight scenes, uh, I'll, you know, it'll be a new chapter and I'll switch to the present tense because, again, you get that sense of being sort of caught up in the melee. Uh, and that seems to, you know, to my eye, I guess, it seems to be what's required. Um, also, because if it's in the present tense with Sally in this scene, you don't know what's going to happen. Nobody knows. Sally doesn't know. The killer knows. But we are sort of taking that walk with her through the forest. So everything that happens to her is a surprise and new to her. And it just feels, you know, I mean, all novel writing is an artifice, isn't it? Because nothing's really happening. But it feels like we are on that sort of little voyage, brief voyage of discovery with her. And I think it means that if, if there's a death or something like that, it, it does slightly more come out of the blue, I think, than if it was in the past tense. You know, there's a bit more energy yeah. with the present tense. Um one, one of the things you do you do very well in this beginning is your is your use of emotion. So we have the the, the opening line: "19 year old Sally Rob feels her stomach squirming, but it's a kind of giddy excitement." Um, so we've got that emotion right there at the beginning, and that is the overriding emotion. And then about halfway through, um, towards the end, where you've had these different cracks, um, and then it says there's a loud rustle and more cracking. Her pulse races. Her nerves are alight. I and mean, now it's not excitement, it's fear. And so the, yeah. the, the scene is sort of bookmarked into these two sections with these two moments of emotion. Uh, and I always tell my students, I always think emotion is so important to, to get in there and bring, bring in. And here you're using it quite carefully in two particular moments uh, for emphasis, uh, it, it yeah. feels. Yeah. And again, I mean, that, oh. oh, no, sorry, Karen. No, I was going to say, was again, was that something that you, you consciously did or is that something that you're kind of naturally doing by kind of starting the emotion and, the, and then shifting it as, as the scene continues? Well, no, it's always, I mean, it's very, with me, it's very 
emotion. I mean, it's you know, it's a planned effect, is what I'm saying. I guess that. Yeah. Um, I always start with characters. You know, when I'm planning a new book, you know, I start with characters and I work up. You know, I mean, I've got an idea, but you know, if you're writing crime, there is that you know a murder, basically. You know, a murder happens, so a lot of that is going to, you know, it's going to fall into place. But I like to know who these people are, and something I really picked up from and incredibly love Stephen King for doing is he really sells you the characters you know that there's a fantastic book called Revival that begins with this awful um you know tragedy and you don't know where it's going and because you he builds up this this woman with her young child and I like you know you've got to care about the victims I think otherwise they're just tin targets at a shooting gallery you know you've got to if you love them if you care about them then when something bad happens, you feel it. So I had, I mean, oh, this girl is on a, a date, you know, he's a bit shy. She says to me, isn't that where he's dumping the bodies? So she's kind of slightly nervous, but she's only 19, doesn't think it's gonna happen to her. And I, and most of us, I think, you know, there are only so many physical ways you can show fear or excitement, you know, it's sweaty palms or it's, butterflies in the stomach you know that that's there's a few signs but I thought it would be fun to to play with that because any sort of psychotherapist will tell you that the feelings you get when you're anxious are actually exactly the same ones you get when you're excited it's just the context alters the way that you perceive what's happening to you so her adrenaline her you know amygdala is firing up because she's excited erotically excited to be on this date and then she thinks they're being terrorized by this weirdo with a massive knife. But then there's a sort of false um, relief when this little Bambi steps out onto the path and she goes, oh, thank God for that. It really is a deer. Only it really isn't. Yeah. Yes, I, I was going to ask about that. It's almost that sort of misdirection that you give the yeah, reader yeah. where you're, you're lulling them into that false sense of security because our, our character's relaxed. And then you have, well, actually, you use very well something else I, I, I I talk about often writing is idea of the rule of three where you have a, a sequence and the third one for emphasis and here you have sort of three cracks and you feel again that you're building up to a moment of something bad is going to happen but then on the third one then you get the deer there and then yeah. it all it all relaxes so actually you're you know it's, it's quite playful with the reader because then you're sort of pulling the rug under them so then by using that contrast when you do get that moment where where something bad happens it has much more impact than if you just, you know, made it kind of big yeah. and scary from yeah, the start. Yeah. Um, it's very, it's, it's, ve it's very, very skillfully done. And the, the other thing I really like about it is that moment of threat at the end. Um, again, I think it's very, it's very easy for that to be quite um, uh, sort of graphic or kind of visual. And here you're using the different senses. So all we have is we have the foot, we have the footsteps behind, and then we have the, you know, the, the, the voice in the ear, and then the smell of lavender. So yeah. it's all quite subtle and evocative. And I think because of that, it feels to me like it has more impact than if you'd shown, you know, the actual action of, of what happens. And again, I wonder, is that something that you consciously set out to do? I mean, you talked about it being general crime are there sort of rules for different crime genres about how dark you can be particularly in the opening couple of pages yeah i mean there are and again you know i i consciously i mean i consciously wanted this particular murder to be i mean it's not so, so much off screen as behind the screen or off to the side of it you know in fact, she doesn't even hear the footsteps, you know, so so at this point, I step back and almost reintroduce myself as the omniscient narrator. Say, she was so busy thinking about the deer, she didn't hear the footsteps. You know, so I'm now sort of taking the reader with me, we're both looking at her and it's just this. And the thing with lavender is it's an interesting smell. I was talking to somebody um, yesterday about it. Virtually everybody knows, you know, can if you say lavender, it's a very pungent, recognizable smell. And I think for different people, it has different emotions, but it's not its not a neutral smell by any means. Um, so that was kind of considered. But with Leodora, when I was planning this series and one of the things I asked her was, how do we make this the most commercial? And what, what are the things we can do to really give it the widest possible audience? And she basically said, the more gore, the more swearing and the more gritty darkness, the older and the maler, the readership skews 
and, and oh, and the, the more swearing as well. So I said, right, we'll have no gore, no blood and guts, no swearing, or, you know, bad swearing, uh, and not too much of the dark, gritty horror. So, you know, you, there's, there's no, nobody's going to get, um, no children are tortured in this series, you know, the, there's no mutilations, or if, if there are, it's going to be done in a way that, I can't remember which author it was who said it, but, you know, the worst scenes are the scenes that are only in the reader's head. So I will give them plenty of information that allows them to imagine all kinds of horrors, but I'm not going to graphically linger or loiter over them. And, and do, do you find when you're not writing that kind of stuff, because obviously I know I've read some of your previous books and, that, and there are certainly dark moments in some of those, by having this, this set up to write in this particular genre, does that feel restrictive or is that quite exciting? Is that a, a, a challenge to appeal to a slightly different audience? Well, it's, I, it, it's wonderful. I mean, I'm really enjoying this um, because intellectually it's a challenge to convey that, you know, that, the, the, the darkest human impulse to murder another human being, you know, the, the, I think that's pretty much it. Um, and to make people feel that they're in the presence of real evil, but without dwelling on the the act itself. And and I think, you know, I watch, I watch a lot of crime on TV, read a lot of horror, and there's something about that moment when the detective comes face to face with a serial killer. And there's this sort of cat and mouse game or whatever it might be. And I'm very interested in the, the tension and the fear and the, the visceral sort of unpleasantness that comes at those sorts of moments. I mean, there's plenty, you know, they're, they're quite violent books, but it's done in such a way. I've got a, a document on my main Mac called 21 Non-Gory Ways to Murder Somebody, which was a fun morning's work. <laughs> I mean, I think somebody gets a nosebleed in this book, but that's it on the on the blood and guts front. Well, I mean, I suppose someone like you know Agatha Christie, who is you know your, your classic crime writer, you know everybody was poisoned, you know, weren't they? Yeah, there, was, yeah. there was little, you know, bludge bludgeoning or kind of violence. It was you know, it was killing, but it was done in a, in a way that felt quite, um, yeah, not 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 too graphic. Uh, that's I right, suppose. Yeah. Uh, um, you, you mentioned your editor a moment ago. So this is this is the first in a series of books that you're writing for Thomas and Mercer, which for those who yeah. don't know is a, is a is an Amazon imprint. Um, and I know that you've written a, a previous series for kind of Amazon before, um, the, yeah. the Detec Detective Ford books. So just talk us through the the, the sequencing of, of how a, a series like this is set up. Do you do you approach Amazon with an idea, or did they approach you? Did you? work up the idea together or separately or how did the back and forth in all of that sure. take um, place? Well, I'm what they call an unagented author. So, um, which is great because I'm not paying somebody 15% of my earnings. Um, how it came about was that one of my stories was shortlisted for the, or novels were shortlisted for the 2018 Kindle Storyteller Awards. Um, and I was in the, the, you know, the party was in full swing. I'd had quite a few glasses of champagne and I, 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 had it in mind that I was going to try and get a publishing deal with Amazon. And so I'm in this room and I'm talking to the lady next to me and I said, so who do you have to talk to around here to get a publishing deal? And she said, well, I'm the publishing director. You can talk to me. It was Laura Deacon, uh, who's now at Bookature. So, and she very generously allowed me to bend her ear for 10 minutes. And she said, right, she said, I'm going to set you up with Jane Snellgrove, who's my acquisitions editor, and we'll, we'll see what we can do. So, there was an initial plan that they might take on Stella Cole, but it didn't work for various sort of technical reasons to do with the, 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 the way the book, the first three books were put together. So Jane and I jointly sort of conceived of Inspector Ford and I, it, it, she invited me to sort of put together a proposal for the first three books, which I did. And there's a bit of toing and froing and off we went. And then the same with Cat Ballantyne, only this time I said to Leodora very much, you know, let's, absolutely craft something that is going to have you know mass crime appeal and i was very keen to step away from the kind of cliched 40 something alcoholic male detective who's divorced drives a classic car you know listens to jazz late at night you know has a crap relationship with his child and all this kind of stuff um partly because it's been done to death and partly because i thought you know there was room to do something different 
Um, so, you know, that's that was the sort of genesis of Kat. You know, she's the op kind of opposite to me. She's a 34 year old woman and I'm a 62 year old man, but we both have a, a son, you know, one at least one son so i kind of built her up and i was thinking about her i know we've gone slightly off topic already but anyone who's seen mayor of east town with um uh i've forgotten her name the actress's name and also happy valley it was you know it was those kind of female detectives that i was um kate winslet that was it those kind of yeah. female cops that i was interested in exploring a bit further in my own work and so when when this particular book was being developed are you are you sending your editor ideas for for plot did do they yeah. have like a do you write a write a treatment and then you go away and write it or how, how does that yeah. set up work i i mean i discuss things like you know where do we stand on serial killers because I've, I've got this idea one of the interesting ideas that um, leodora gave to me was that it's great when a character is carrying guilt for something that wasn't their fault so they but you know it's like a millstone it's something they drag around with them, it's emotional baggage but they didn't do it you know it wasn't cat's fault as an 18 year old that her friend got murdered by a serial killer but she feels it was she blew her off for drinks and that was the night that that it happened um and then so i wrote a, a fair you know a sort of three page treatment for the seventh girl and then a one pager for the second one and then just a few paragraphs for the third one and they were like yeah you know that's great we'll go with that um there were pro i can't remember but you know there were probably discussions about some of the sort of plot points but essentially it was they were like nope this is all good we like the sound of that and i'd been through this process once before remember with inspector ford so i i had an idea of what would sell and what would work and where we were trying to go and, and we decided early on that this would be a fictional place. And I said that her kind of secret source, her superpower is not that she's, you know, got some slightly psychic ability or eidetic memory. It's just that she's grown up in this place and she knows the villains as well as the victims. You know, she knows the petty drug dealers. She's drunk in some of the pubs they have and she's hung around with them when they were all teenagers. And she's worked in uniform, so she knows the sex workers and, and all of this kind of thing. So she's just of this place. And I thought that was a really interesting, you know, idea that I knew I would enjoy sort of exploring. And, and when you're when you're writing a series, obviously this is this is the the, the, the fourth multi-book character you're you have you've, yeah. you've worked on. Are you, as well as planning the first novel, are you planning a sort of series arc? for this character and how they're going to kind of grow and develop and, and change over not just that first book, but then over a kind of series of books as well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, again, a very conscious with Gabriel Wolf, which is the, the first and longest running series, it, it all happened by accident. And I had to start thinking arc wise quite a way in. Um, I was actually helped by a fortuitous error of timing when I, I had him watching his mother breastfeeding his sibling. And because of the timings, it couldn't have been the, the existing sibling. So it turned out that there was a third child that he had completely, you know, was completely unaware of. But with Kat, at any rate, I, I planned it from the beginning. And how I see it is a, a series of kind of little, little arcs. So there's kind of book, 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 where each novel has an arc, you know, a three act structure or whatever. And we know where it's going to end up. Then, then I tend to think in sort of three book arcs over those. So over a period of three years or, or three cases, what's going to happen longer term? And there are relationships that span, you know, she's got this tool of a boss, absolute asshole, who hates her and she hates him. And that's a sort of, you know, developing. But I'm also thinking in a sort of, you know, perhaps a sort of nine book arc, let's say that, you know, where is she going over the years? And she is going to age, but she's going to age gradually. You know, and I, I quite like that she's 34. She's got places to go in terms of her age as well as her career. So although I don't know, have all the details, I know I, I have some good ideas about where she's going to be going in, in the next sort of three, six, nine books. And I, I guess if you're writing in this genre, you know, that the, the successful crime books tend to be written in series. So you need to be thinking in that slightly longer 
way. So have, having that thinking and that planning in, in, in the back of your mind is, is, is really, really useful. Um, I wanted to ask you a little bit about setting. Um, so this, this book is set in a, in, a, in a place called Middlehampton, which is a, a, a fictional place within Hertfordshire, I think it is, which yeah. is an English, English county for those watching uh, further afield. Um, your, your previous series was set in, in Salisbury, which is a real place I know very well because it's where, where we both live. Um, and I just wonder about the difference between um, setting a series in a real place versus a, a fictional place and what the advantages and disadvantages uh, are for you for, yeah. both, for both those options. I mean, it's a, it's a good question. I find it easy in some ways to answer the, the, the question at Middlehampton, um, which is I was influenced by the great uh, Val McDermott, who set her main series in Bradfield, which is across between Bradford and Sheffield, you know, linguistically. And uh, although she was actually interviewed and said if she'd known how long that series was going to go on with Tony Hill, you know, she would never have done that. But I... I quite like the freedom of creating somewhere. You know, Middlehampton's about 250,000 people, so it's a biggish town. So it's got a premiership football team, it's got a sea life world, you know, a sea aquarium sort of attraction. It's got old bits, it's got new bits, it's got rough neighbourhoods, it's got a business district. I can sort of play around with it, and I'm not constrained by one of the disadvantages, I think, with, with setting it somewhere like Salisbury or Western Supermare or wherever people set it is inevitably people who know it well will start sort of focusing on <laughs> geographical details which really don't matter uh, and people who don't know it well i mean if they don't know it well why does it have to be real in the first place um i i don't know it just it it ended up i think for me feeling a bit parochial that the inspector ford books or a bit provincial uh, as you know salisbury is a really tiny place um sort of 30 40 thousand people and I, I just thought it would be more fun to create a fictional town for a, because it's a work of fiction. Um, and, and, and is that town created from scratch or are you basing it on elements of either, you know, particular places or places that you know and fusing them together? How, how imagined is it as a, as a location? Oh, completely unimagined. Um, the only thing I've done is stuck all these things together. I invented the name and there's a triangle of nothingness in Hertfordshire between three sort of major towns and I just plonked it in there. It's partly the town where I grew up, which is Hemel Hempstead, which is a kind of mixture of an, a, a Tudor town, you know, so 1500s, which gradually expanded and then post Second World War was, you know, you may know, it just became a new town, so called with a lot of building, not of new houses. Uh, so it's partly that, it's partly bits of Salisbury's older kind of medieval centre. And then, you know, I've got children in, in Birmingham and, and Leeds, and I like the feel of those big sized cities slash towns. You know, there's 250 to 500,000 people. There's an energy to those places and you've got, you know, mass transit systems, you know, you've got public transport, you've got trams, you've got football stadiums and cricket stadiums and big museums and big municipal libraries and town halls. So I've just kind of picked and chosen the bits of places I've lived and visited that I thought would, would really work together. Um, um, yeah. There's, 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 a, there's a question in, in the chat and we're going to have time for questions towards the end, so do, do get the questions in. But Melina's asking, is it necessary to create a fictional world Bible? And have you got a big document and a, and a map of what your fictional town looks like? Uh, Melina, that's an excellent question. And do you know what? Yes, I actually have. I'm so it's not in one place, but I found that you can buy maps from uh, in this country Ordnance Survey, which is the kind of government, you know, state-owned mapping agency. I bought a map of Luton, which is a, a not dissimilar town to Middlehampton. But you can you can change the legend on the map, so I had them put Middlehampton in instead. And I've just written over, so it's you know it's pinned up on the wall, and I use the sharpie and i've marked up the neighborhoods like you know northbridge and cherryville and sheepton and i've put all that stuff on so that's my geography i've got a list of street names that i use i've got a you know all the sort of political structure worked out um the football club uh, is called the eels because eel fishing was a big deal in this town so yes i have this sort of 
town gazetteer come Bible that I can sort of refer to if I get stuck. But also, you know, I, I kind of live there for a month or two while I'm writing the book. But I can also refer back to previous books to think, hang on, what's the name of the street the police station is on? Is it Union Street or Crown Street? So I've got this sort of, um, I don't think it's necessary, but I have a shocking memory. So it's, I find it very useful. No, I think it's it's, 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 it's a really uh, important document to have. And I suppose particularly if you're writing more than one book set in the same locations that you need that consistency, you can't suddenly invent, you know, different streets or, or things, you know, things start kind of messing up b- between yeah. them. And, and just, I mean, sort of linked to that, I wanted to ask you briefly about the topic of research. I mean, I saw in your in your acknowledgements that the, f- the, the first people you thank in your acknowledgements actually are a number of kind of police officers who you've yeah. spoken to. I think I think there's actually, there's about like nine or 10. About a dozen, yeah, in, yeah. A dozen in the list. And I just wonder if you could just talk us through um, that process of, of research. Are you, are you talking to police officers for authenticity before you write or do you go and ask some questions you know how, how does that set up work mainly before um i count myself very fortunate to have so many friends who do these kinds of jobs i mean i used to live in chiswick which people who don't know is a very shishi neighborhood of west london um almost it's a sort of you know very white middle to upper middle class neighborhood everyone's a kind of professional person um and all our friends were kind of marketing people and accountants and management consultants. And 20 years ago, we moved down to Salisbury and I, I now have two army colonels amongst my friends, coppers, train drivers, you know, nursery nurses, teachers, doctors, every kind of job you can imagine. Um, I'm very fortunate that one of the guys who I knew from the school run is a former homicide detective. He was a, a detective superintendent. And I would sort of take an idea up to Sean's and over a coffee, I'd say so. You're in the woods, there's a girl's body on the ground and she's been, she's got this stuff coming out of her mouth, you know, it, uh, you know, and her hair's been chopped off. What would you do? And he sort of walked me through an investigation from start to finish, really. Um, but it's also what I like to ask cops about is, is not the procedural stuff. It's more like the life or they call it in this country, the job. You know, and they will say you are job. So you can't write it down with a capital letter because it looks like you're saying you are Job. Um, but, you know, it's like, what does a police station smell like? What's the inside of a CID office like? And one, one of them said, um, Jen Gibbons, well, it smells a lot of fast food. You've got the radios on. There's, there's kind of all the herbal teas along the window, so which nobody touches. Um, and I also, for research, did a, a shift with a, a response and patrol unit near here. So uniformed officers in cars, uh, Friday night three o'clock in the afternoon till three in the morning, which was really an eye opener. I mean, if you ever, anyone who's watching, if you ever get the chance to ride along with your local police officers, take it with both hands. You know, I was seeing fights. There was a girl in the street uh, in care who had a knife and the copper had to get it off her. There was, you know, concerns over vulnerable people. There was a violent uh, guy who had to be subdued. And this is the kind of, this is gold dust because you can't get this on the internet. You can get a lot on the internet and you get a lot in books, but you can't necessarily get those kind of experiences. I had a taser pointed at me and then the warning charge, you know, (laughs) this and a crackling and you see the blue arc. That's quite scary. So it's got to the point now where I kind of know a lot of the stuff I want to know in advance, but there will be times when I need a specific bit of info particularly on the Stella Cole series, which is now set in Sweden. And I have a CSI, a Swedish CSI, um, who I found on LinkedIn. And she's great. I can ask her, you know, what, because they have a different um, jurisprudential system there. The police and the prosecutors work in a different way. Uh, the, the forensic medicine works in a different way. So I've been able to, to tap her for info as well. Uh, oh, yeah, and I, I also have this brilliant, sorry, one last thing. It's called the Practical Homicide Investigators Manual by a guy called Vernon Gibberth. It cost me a hundred bucks. And it's the actual kind of murder manual in the States. We kind of absolutely no uh, punches pulled in terms of the photography, but it's a fantastic resource as well. It sounds, yeah, I mean, I think all, all of that's important for, you know, to, to build that um, authenticity in the books. And there's some lovely details in this. There's one bit where, uh, the protagonist goes to um, 
uh, and, and goes goes to an autopsy. Um, and there's so is it the Earl of Camphor? So there's a, there's a new detective there where she kind of tells him, you know, so you've got to sort of, you know, use it to kind of help kind of kind of deaden the smell a little bit. And, and yeah. it's those little details that make it feel authentic and ring true. And I suppose because crime fiction is such a popular genre that people know their onions, they know they know their stuff when it comes to crime fiction. So if if, if those facts aren't right, you're going to get you know pulled up by um, by readers, yeah. and you get a lot of cops and people you know in law enforcement who read as well. And I, a friend of mine, um, Chris Thornby, who's a, a you know, uniformed officer, was the sergeant when I did this uh, ride along. He says you can't watch it on telly because he drives him nuts. You know the sort of errors, uh, and they you know they they know it's uh, you have to take some artistic license because uh, you know. 90% of the coppering is spent behind a computer screen. You know, you're just doing paperwork. Um, the other thing that actually I have learned um, is that above the level of a detective sergeant, you are not interviewing suspects. You are not going out to crime scenes. You're not looking at dead bodies. You're not in the autopsy suite. You are management. In fact, a detective inspector is already senior management. So I always... And I've done it myself, you know, obviously, but um, when you see a series, it's like DCI, you know, Detective Chief Inspector Bromley. This guy is like regional managing director level. You know, I mean, you are you are nine to five. You're part of what they call the nine o'clock jury. You know, you do Monday to Friday, nine to five. You spend your life with spreadsheets and budgets and personnel and metrics and, you know, all of this. DCIs do not go out having fistfights with, with gangsters and, you know, poking around in, in a dead body. It never happens. So, which was one of the reasons why I wanted Kat to be a detective sergeant, because that's the level where you are a senior case officer, but you are on the ground wearing out shoe leather, talking to people. Um, yeah. Good answer. Um, th there's been some discussion in, in the comments about um, the differences between publishing and, and self-publishing. And obviously you're, you're you're, you're published at the moment, but I think your your earlier books, you, when you started, yeah. you you self published. I wonder if you could tell us a little bit of the the difference in the in the experience and and how you you know how you make both those different kind of uh, types of publishing work and, and which feels you know right for you. And if you're a new author, yeah. which, which route would you recommend kind of going oh, wow. down? You might have to go on a bit longer than another okay. sort of fifteen <laughs> minutes. I'll try and keep it short and concise. Okay. Um, <laughs> The first thing I would say about self-publishing is it's not for everybody. If you don't have an appetite for marketing, don't get into self-publishing because it's, you know, you will fool yourself into thinking you are published or you have published your novel. Uh, but really, people who aren't prepared to do the marketing are not really, in my opinion, only. It's more like self-uploading than self-publishing. You know, if you if you write a book you know, get your friend or your auntie to proofread it and then put it on the Kindle store. That's not really publishing. You know, the, the, even the guys at the Kindle store, who I know quite well, don't know how many books there are on the Kindle store, but it's tens of millions, you know. So you need to be visible. And to be visible with a good quality product, you have to act as your own publisher, which means you have to invest in all the things you can get on Readsy you know, an editor, a proofreader, a cover designer, audiobook narrators, the whole thing. Um, because readers aren't fools. The, the one thing I've learned is readers don't care whether it's self-published or traditionally or hybrid or digital first. Uh, they may not even know that those are things. What they know is they love Georgian romance or science fiction or bad boy biker billionaire books or police procedurals or Swedish noir, whatever it might be. And they just want a good book. Now, if it's good, if it's a good book, that means you've invested in the quality as a publisher, but they're not going to find it unless you've also invested in the marketing as a publisher. So you get 70% of the royalties, but you have to spend all the money. And over the years, I've spent about three quarters of a million pounds, sorry, dollars, three quarters of a million dollars on advertising on my credit card. Wow. Uh, which is wow, but I have made twice that uh, in sales. So that's actually also wow. And if you've got a business head, you know that that's okay. The lovely thing with, with being published is you don't have to do any of that. You just write the book and people love you and they butter you up because you're the talent. 
and for their troubles they take the lion's share they take 70 percent or if it's a trad deal probably more like 87 and a half or whatever it might be and i see people on various facebook groups i belong to railing against publishers you know god you know i only get 10 percent it's like well you can have 70 percent, but then the publisher won't do any advertising and nobody will see your book and then you have to spend all that money you can't you know you can't have your cake and eat it you have to choose i actually love both processes you know they they have different things that i like about it i like the collegiateness i like the opportunity to work with publishing professionals as a published author and best of all is those people are not your employees Thomas and Mercer editors are paid by Thomas and Mercer or by Amazon. So if they think your book stinks, they will tell you. Whereas if you're paying a freelance editor, I'm struggling to think even the most candid freelance will say, this is a stinker. Cause you know, they're going to put an invoice in, in, in three weeks. So, you know, to be self-published, I think you need a thick skin. You also need to be super willing to be candid with yourself and, and get your editorial people to be honest with you and your cold readers and your beta readers and everything else. But it's horses for courses. You know, I mean, some people have never self-published. Some people only self-publish. I mean, I, I'm sort of across the board uh, and love them all. And I suppose one of the advantages with self-publishing is that you've got you've got that more freedom that you're kind of you know directing things your, yourself. Uh, and I and I think and I'm not plugging Reedsy particularly here, but I think you've used Reedsy to find your editors and proofreaders and, and and so on for a number of those books. So as you say, you've got you've got to kind of behave as your as, as your own publisher going going through. I mean, one of one of the challenges I think with when would you then switch to a, a more traditional publisher is that the lead time suddenly lengthen. Oh, a little okay. bit. Yeah, so if yeah, you're self-publishing, I mean, you can finish the book and publish it straight away. If you're being published by a traditional publisher, then there's a a, a time delay. I mean, I mean, th this book was out at the start of this year. You know, when, when did you when did you finish oh, writing this? About a year ago, I think. The, the the I mean, I'm not telling tales at school particularly, but I mean, Amazon and I think all the digital first things. You know, it's typically is a sort of a year. You know, nine months to eighteen months kind of turnaround time, whereas self-publishing, I can get a book, um, depending on the lead times of everyone I'm working with, about six months, I would I would sort of reckon on. Um, I mean, I could do it sooner, but I actually like to build in time for the pre-orders, you know, so I will allow myself maybe a month or two when it's done just on the marketing. So you could do it quicker than that. But again, is there any advantage to rushing a book up onto the Kindle store if you don't have a thoroughly worked out marketing plan, I would argue that there isn't. Um, it's very, you know, it, it's pleasing when you can go onto Amazon and see your book there, but you've searched for that by name and you've called it up. Nobody else is doing that. You know, nobody else is searching for your book because it only appeared today. So it's down at the bottom of this, you know, vast iceberg of, sort of 40 million titles. It's better to wait and do it strategically, I think. And, and and this new book, The Seventh Girl, was chosen as a is the Amazon First Reads yes. promotion. Do you want to tell us a little bit about what, what that's like and, and how that works? Oh, it's a rush. I mean, it, it, again, that also added to the lead time because there's sort of some negotiation to be done. And we ended up with a globe, what they call a global first read. So it's basically the Anglosphere. So it's the US, Canada, Australia, and the UK. Uh, it goes out on the first of the month preceding publication. There's an email, there's the Amazon first reads page. There's also kind of promotional activity. Um, I'm not able to share the numbers, but they're, they're huge. The downloads have been astronomical. I mean, it's been amazing, you know, a real shock. What you can see on the page is that it's had 7,000 600 and something, uh, what do you call it, you know, ratings, and a, you know, a huge number of reviews in a month, which is, you know, pretty good, I think. Um, so and the, the hard copy sales, you know, the, 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 the non offer sales have done really, really well, well as well. So and it was great to get that exposure in the US as well. It's brilliant. And we've got about yeah, yeah, sorry, go. Only that so I was going to say, you struggle with, I think. Yeah, and we've got about ten minutes left. So if you've got questions, Randy, do do fire them into the um, into the comments, and we'll see what we can get through. So one question here from from Sandy, 
ask if you publish on, under an Amazon imprint, will your book reach independent bookstores? Yes, uh, it will. Um, through I think Amazon have the deal with gardeners who are the book wholesalers, Tom, is that right? Yes, there are book wholesalers in the UK. So uh, they, I mean, they'll reach them if, if somebody orders one. I don't think they would necessarily stop them. Um, I'm yeah. not, I mean, you know, my experience is pretty much digital first. I mean, I sell 98% of my books as uh, eBooks and I have various friends and I know there is this thing about, you know, you go into Waterstones or whatever your local book, look, here is me, you know, here's me and my local Waterstones with my book. And I would say, yeah, that, but that means nobody's bought it. If, if your book's in a shop, that means nobody's bought it. I kind of uh, discounted all that sort of thing, really. But yes, the short answer is you can get physical distribution with, with an Amazon imprint. Um, there's a question from uh, Jay Nichols who asks, what is your editing process? Do you write vomit drafts for chapters without any editing and come back to it later with a clear head? How do you, how do you work through the different drafts? Yeah, well, you know, that's a good question. And it's the second time I've heard that word vomit draft in two days. Um, no is the short answer. I mean, I, oh, well, I don't know, because you mean by vomit, I've tightened up my first drafts a lot over the last eight, nine years. So I used to do that and just write and write and write. Now what I try and do is only write what I'm going to keep. Um, there's a bit that um, Elmore, is it Elmore James said, I try to skip the bits my readers aren't going to read. And I try to skip writing those in the first place because it's a waste of time. Um, and as I've moved more towards planning, what goes into a chapter? And with the latest book, I've had a chapter by chapter outline. So it's like an 11,000 word treatment. Um, there's no extraneous stuff to be written because if it's not in the plan, I'm not going to bother writing it. So I write a tight first draft. I try and avoid editing as I'm going along, but it's not always possible. But I try to just splurge it out there. And then I'm, I am going to come back to, to it later with a clear head. So it's kind of half and half, really, if that makes okay. sense. That does. That's a good answer. And there's a question from Larry uh, McLaughlin who asks, uh, can you talk about how you use dialogue for shaping characters? moving the story, etc. I'm weak on, on dialogue. Is, is that something that you find easy or difficult to, to write? Uh, Larry, it's a good question. I'll be honest with you. I find dialogue comes very naturally to me. Um, I'm a musician in my spare time. I think I've got a good ear generally. Um, I'm always eavesdropping on people's conversations. I, you know, I, I think I'm wired for I'm very verbally wired, you know, um, much more than I am mathematically. So I, one of the things I love about using dialogue is you can you can have people bouncing off each other, reacting to each other. Uh, sometimes you want to say she said this, or you can summarize a conversation. Um, but other times it just seems more natural. If you put two cops in a room together, or, or the classic for me is a, a suspect and a cop in the interview room, I find those scenes incredibly tense. And one of the things that happens to me is that after, when I'm writing a, in a writing session, after about 10, 15 minutes, it feels to me like a, a relay clicks over my brain and I stop writing what's happening. In other words, I stop inventing what's happening and I start recording what's happening. Uh, it's a very weird sensation. It's kind of a flow state, but I, they start to behave on their own. Um, one of the tips I guess I've got, if you're weak on dialogue, one would be to read authors. Uh, there's a guy called Richard White, I think. No, his book's called The Whites. I can't remember. He's a crime author, American crime author. One of his books is called The Whites. His dialogue is amazing. Um, I wrote a blog post about dialogue, uh, which I, I won't plug, but if you, you might find it, Andy Maslin, author, dialogue, blog post. Because there are different ways of doing it. The one thing I don't think is a good idea is that kind of you, you know, you listen to somebody on the train or on the bus or in a, in a street, and then you think, oh God, that's just how real people talk, and you kind of transcribe that, and it's sort of hyper naturalistic, and it just comes off as really sort of fake, believe it or not. You need to sort of tighten that dialogue up, because if you say like, you know, and then, well, but is it really? You know, that is how people talk, but it just looks rubbish on the page. So you have to have this kind of artifice that it sounds natural um and there's a great tip my author my editor russell mcclain says he hates this dialogue where you get two people who are both experts and they'll say as you know tom 
uh, armor-piercing bullets tend to have a titanium core so that they can penetrate even the chop of armor invented by Max Mosley in 1365. And he's right, you know, it's a way of dumping your research in and cheating by saying, no, it's just a character saying this. And the book I'm reading at the moment has two very senior members of the American intelligence establishment. One actually says to the other, as you know, Bob, a limpet mine is designed to attach to the outside of a ship's hull. And then this is a chunk of, you know, the American manual of limpet mine design. And he's put speech marks around and go, that'll do. It won't do. You know, it, nobody talks like that. Um, there's, there's a two-part question from Brian, which we'll see, have a quickly answer with, I'll have time for one more, but he's asking about your marketing spend. He was curious, which, which, which part of that got the best return uh, and which, which part uh, was the biggest waste of money? Oh, we, there's an old quote uh, from the marketing world in this country from, attributed to Lord Leverhulme, who founded Lever Brothers, a big soap company. And he said, half the money I spend on advertising is wasted. The trouble is, I don't know which half. Um, and that is, I couldn't possibly tell you. I mean, all I can tell you is I, I don't start with huge sums of money. I typically start an ad, a new ad with $10 a day and I'm on it like a hawk. You know, I look at it every day and if it's not working, I ditch it. If it is working, I put another 50% on and leave it and another and another and another. Um, and where, sorry, can I just ask, where, where yeah. are these ads going? Are they, are they on social media? Are they on Facebook or, or YouTube? Yeah. Or, or, the where bulk is these Facebook. Yeah, the, bul the bulk of it is Facebook and I also advertise on Amazon UK. The problem with Amazon is you, it won't spend as much money as you want to spend necessarily. There's a very, the, I haven't got my head around the bidding system yet. Whereas with Facebook, if you say I want to spend a thousand dollars a day, it will cheerfully spend it for you. Um, and I want to make it absolutely clear, these are, these are Facebook ads, they're not boosted posts. They're a waste of money. I, I don't do those. What I do is I create ads in Ads Manager, and I set up the campaigns, and I choose the audience and the works. Um, um, yeah, there's, there's so, there's, no, that's really good. Um, there's so many questions here. I just want to finish on, on one here uh, from, from Brianna, who says, I would love to know your writing schedule um i'm curious on this too are you do you have a set time in the day when you write how long do you write do you have a set deadline in terms of how many words you want to write a day? how does it work okay hi brianna a great question and again a bit like the kind of town bible yes i do have a writing schedule and this is it i write monday to friday 10 to 1 and my aim is to write 2000 words a day which is 10,000 words a week, which is a book every two months. Or a, let me rephrase that immediately, a first draft in two months. Um, in the afternoons, I might look at my marketing. If I'm really cooking, which I was recently, and I was, I, you know, it was insane. I was writing 6,000 words a day. I'll keep going until tea time. I did develop really bad RSI in both my forearms, and, and that was a direct cause of that. Um, but I, you know, as I say, increasingly as I've sort of worked on planning, I can, I don't have to sort of switch between thinking what's coming next and how am I going to describe it. My writing time is all composing the first draft. So yeah, that's it. 10 to 1, Monday to Friday, plus. Very nice. Andy, look, it's been a, it's been a fascinating hour. Thank you so much for, for spending oh, the time uh, to talk to us this evening. Um, so The Seventh Girl is, is, is out now. It's, 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 a, it's a brilliant book. It's, it's um, the, the first in the series. When is, when is the second one in the series out? The second one's out, played... out in May, third one's out in November. Okay. Um, it, it's, you know, I'd really recommend it. if you're looking for a new kind of crime series to get stuck into, uh, this is one I, I would I would look at. Um, thank you, everyone who's, who's asked questions this evening. I'm sorry we couldn't get through uh, all of them this evening. Um, if you're interested in, in, in Breedsy, uh, and Andy was mentioning um, how he uses kind of editors, um, copy editors and proofreaders and, and, and other people for his books. Do look at the marketplace if you're interested in that. If you're interested in, in the writing courses, um, do look at that as well. I think the details will come up on, on, on the screen and I think there is a, 
a code as well for a, a discount. There we go. Um, yes, if you, if you go to use the code Maslin24, you can get 10% off uh, the, the, the discount until February the 4th. Um, I think more details will, 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 will post later. Um, and we've got a new cohort starting on February the 19th, uh, April uh, the 8th. So if you're interested in that, do Google uh, and have a look at those as well. But thank you, everyone, for your questions this evening. Thank you, Andy, for your time. Um, you. Happy writing. Good luck Thank you. Uh, with, with your books on from Thank here. You. Thank you, Andy. Thank you, everyone. Have good evenings, afternoons, mornings, wherever you are. Uh, and we'll see you all again uh, very, very soon. Good night.